So because I am already doing a guide on how to tune your Speedwino or tune a studio based ECU, I also want to show you how to convert any car to standalone ECU. So for example, Speedwino, ECU Master, Link Haltech, etc. Whatever is on the market, it can be done as long as there are some factors present and what that is. And also in the next video, I'm going to show you how to wire up that exactly. Um, this is going to be showcased here. So what exactly needs to be present in a car to make it work with a standalone ECU? Well, there are a few things that you have to consider. First of all, it needs to be a bit older uh, than like I'd say 2010 or so because most of the standalone ECUs that are in a price range that is not above 5k cannot control direct injection. So you pretty much have to leave those cars out of the question, at least if you don't want to spend like 5k on a ECU itself. Then obviously you need a car that is not carbureted but fuel injected because you cannot control the carburetor since that is mechanical and not electronical. And also you need a electronic ignition system. So that's either for example with uh, coils, so ignition coils, or with a electronically uh, controlled distributor. That also works because that has a feedback pin from that the ACU tells the distributor when to fire. So that also works and that's basically it. That's the requirements for a car to make it possible to convert it to a standalone ECU. What standalone ECU you want to buy is obviously your choice. You can go from a 150 bucks Speedwino unit, which is on the very cheap end, all the way up to like a $2,000 Haltech or Link or whatever you want to do. And that depends on a few factors on what you want to do with the car. The wiring though, or what you need at the minimum, which I'm going to show you now, is the same on all of the cars though, on, or on all of the ECUs. So that basically doesn't change over that whole course. Going over the parts that you also need for the car to work or for the ECU to work in that car. Basically, you only need a wideband AFR gauge because without a wideband you are not able to tune the ECU correctly or you're not able to tune fuel incorrectly. While there are narrow band gauges available, I have done a video on that, they cannot be tuned accurately, they can give you readings um, over or under 14.7 or stoichiometric, uh, so which is the perfect ratio on uh, burning air and fuel but uh, they can only show a very narrow range. So that means uh, why, that's why it's called narrow band. And um, they are not very accurate and also pretty slow to respond. While yes, they are very cheap and maybe you might be able to go around and uh, get it working and get the car running. Yes, um, it might not be the best idea to rely on those gauges and you should rather get a wideband gauge, even if it is a bit more expensive. The other sensors or everything else that is needed, or most of the cars should already have. So this would be temperature sensors, uh, crank and cam signal, but there's a few differences. First of all, the most important thing is to get the car actually, or get the ECU to even CRPM is a crank signal. Basically any engine has a uh, crank position sensor that measures a wheel that is on crankshaft or sometimes it's also within the distributor and there is a sensor that measures a wheel that for example has a locating pin or a multiple tooths in a lot of cases, for example, on VW and Audi ones or VW Audi engines, they have a 60 minus two wheel on the crankshaft. So it has 60 tooth and two tooth are missing. Uh, so that tells the ECU at which point the engine is in its stroke or at that moment. So you need at least that, at least a crankshaft signal. And then you would be able to 
use the ECU already. So you would see a RPM. Although there are a few differences here. While with a missing tool, uh, tooth wheel, such as a 60-2 or a 36-2 that you can install on a crankshaft, for example, um, to get sequential ignition and sequential injection working, so that is basically on a four cylinder engine that every injector or every coil fires individually, so not two at the same time, you need to have a camshaft signal as well so that the ECU knows in what position the camshaft actually is in. Every camshaft rotation, the crank rotates two times actually. So the engine is in two different strokes even if the camshaft only rotates once so if the ecu only knows the crankshaft rotation it can only fire two cylinders at once because it doesn't know in what stroke the engine is currently and therefore you only can run wasted spark or paired injection this doesn't really matter that much but it will reduce the efficiency and the engine will run a bit rougher uh, then with for example sequential injection and sequential ignition as for if you can run that on your stock sensors or your stock trigger pattern that depends on if your trigger pattern for example has a symmetrical layout for example a 60-2 wheel is pretty easy to configure because you can configure that within tuner studio or within most ECUs you can put in a number of teeth and put in a number of missing tooth and then you will have a trigger pattern and most of the time that would work and already should show RPM. The issue comes in when you for example have a asymmetrical trigger setup. In that case there are a few pre-configured trigger patterns within ECUs or a few base maps that have these trigger patterns built in. But on those cases, especially if it's not a very common engine, then you might have to install a 36-2 trigger wheel on your crankshaft. That means using your harmonic balancer to mount a trigger wheel on there and for example use a cherry hall effect sensor to get that trigger pattern and then you would also have the opportunity to run that at wasted spark and paired injection. If you, for example, would also need sequential then, then you would need to also run a signal on the camshaft. That though is most of the time possible because most engines do have a cam sensor or a separate cam sensor and you can just use that. Then there comes the point determining when the engine has to fire. I also have a video on that on my tuning series. I will link that in the description below. That is basically finding the angle from top dead center or from the engine being at top dead center to the first tooth after the missing tooth being seen by the sensor. That is basically a trigger offset and from that onwards, your ECU knows when it's at top dead center and from that on it calculates your uh, ignition table or spark table. What else do you need to get your engine running? Well, you have the RPM now. So your ECU sees how fast your engine is running. So it will basically want to fire everything like injectors and spark. Obviously, as I said before, you can run now your injectors or your spark setup in two different ways. You can run from two outputs to four spark plugs or from two outputs to four injectors. You can run your fueling and your ignition in, for example, wasted spark or paired injection. This would be possible, as I said, with a missing tooth wheel without a cam signal. So without a cam sync. The other option would be a full sequential option. Then you can run every spark output and every injection output from the ECU to each injector, which would be the ideal scenario. If you, for example, have a distributor setup, in that case, you would only run one spark signal from the ECU to the distributor. And that's where your fuel and your spark setup would be. For setting up fuel tables and spark tables, you can obviously watch my Speedwino series and that applies to most of the other ECUs as well, depending on the software. It's pretty similar on these two. 
What sensors do you need other than these few? Well, you might be able to get your engine even started now, but uh, it will not run correctly or rather it may start when it's cold, but it may not start when it's hot because you don't have a indicator for the ECU how warm your engine actually is. And an engine needs more fuel to start when it is cold. So you need a coolant temperature sensor. This is basically to tell the ECU how warm the engine is, how much fuel to inject when starting up because as I said, it needs more fuel when it's cold and it will not turn on if you, for example, inject the same amount of fuel uh, on a cold start when the engine is at operating temperature. You will just wet out the spark plugs and the engine will not start. So you need a coolant temperature sensor. That is pretty easy. There are multiple types of temperature sensors. Some just use one wire and then are calculated with a resistance. And with that, you will be able to start the engine. Then you only need to wire up your oxygen or AFR sensor or wideband sensor, which is if you have already wired it so that it shows in the gauge. Usually those gauges have a five volt output and a ground for that five volt output. That five volt output is only wired into the ECU that has a five volt input. And then you ground out the minus five volt or ground. And then you have your AFR signal within your software and can read that and you can already tune fueling. Though your engine will run now and with the integrated map sensor that is in basically every uh, standalone ECU that has to be connected, it will run decently and you can make it run without anything else and it will run relatively okay. One thing I would also recommend that you install or that you tell the ECU is your throttle position. The TPS sensor basically tells the ECU how far your throttle body is open. On older cars, you might need to change that sensor because some older cars, such as NA Miata, uh, do only have a 0-1 sensor, so that shows either the throttle is closed or it's open. So that will not really work for that. You will need a continuously variable uh, sensor that shows an analog, basically an analog value to the ECU so that it will be able to run. Depending on what sensor you have, you will have to look at the pinout and you can wire that into the ECU pretty easily. The other thing is what you might want to use or though it is not that important on an NA engine as the intake air temperature doesn't vary as much is an intake air temperature sensor. That works similarly to the coolant temperature sensor though it has not as, as large of an effect on the engine. But due to air when it's colder being denser, the engine will need more fuel when the air it is taking in is colder. So this value is going to influence your fueling somewhat. So I would recommend using this and would recommend also installing an intake air temperature sensor to get your fueling right. Obviously you could also use uh, EGO controls or your Lambda control to correct for that, but it's not ideal and it's better to get everything working as it should be without any corrections first and then get the corrections working so that you have a factor that can correct any errors or any fluctuation in outside or in the environment for example. So that's basically it what you need for getting your car to run on a standalone ECU. Obviously if there's a plug and play version that makes things a lot easier and you don't have to wire anything but that's not always the case and in a lot of cars you have to do the wiring yourself. In the next video we are going to look at wiring all this because that is probably the thing that is most confusing or most difficult about this whole setup. Uh, at least it is for me and um, that's why I'm going to show you that as well. Until then see you next time. Bye.